Hey, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mr. Starr, and I am one of the couple voices that you may hear as we go through world history here in trimester two. So I just want to give you a quick introduction to, uh, to who I am. If you ever need some help on anything, guys, I am in room 239. I can definitely help you out with your world history questions. But we're going to go ahead, guys, and get into today Charlemagne and the Franks. All right, so we'll give you a little background on who Charlemagne is and what the situation is in Europe at this point in history. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at Charlemagne, the Franks, and then we're going to get into uh, the Vikings as well. All right, so a little bit of background on the Franks and a little bit of background on what's going on here in Europe. Last time we talked about Europe, we talked about the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And when that happened, all these other groups kind of came in to fill in the space, the Ostagoths and the Genipedes and the Wisigoths and the Burgans and the Franks and the Saxons. All these groups kind of came in and filled in that territory that the Romans had once controlled. We can still see the Eastern Roman Empire over there. Remember, we talked about the Byzantine Empire last trimester at the very end of the trial. And so that's kind of where we are left off here. And so we're going to look into specifically the group that is called the Franks here. And when we talk about the Franks, um, like we said, all of this happens after the, the main Roman Empire falls, the Western Roman Empire. And when we talked about barbarian invasions, the Franks were one of those barbarian groups that came in and settled in this area. Now, we know that they are Germanic peoples. Uh, they lived along the Rhine River um, and in kind of present day um, Germany and part of uh, present day France as well. Uh, we also know that they were very loyal to their family and kind of their, their clans or their kin. Um, and we know that they created the what we would know as kind of present day France, that territory of France. When we look a little bit further into the background here. One of the famous uh, Frankish rulers was named Clovis. Clovis uh, was a member of the Merovingian family, which was the ruling family of the Frankish people at this time. And uh, one of his things that he did was he actually converted the Franks to Christianity. Right? So prior to that, like we said, they were kind of the barbarians, the, the pagan group that came in and, and over, helped to overthrow the, uh, the Romans. Well, now they, they too have converted to Christianity at this, at this point. And so the Christian church became one of the major supporters of the, the Frankish people and vice versa. And like we said, they ended up, uh, Clovis specifically ended up ruling much of present day France, that whole territory around there. Until he was, uh, until he died, and when what was customary at this time when a, a king died is his uh, empire was broken up and given to each of his sons, and so that is we we see the kind of the end of that uh, version of the uh, Frankish Empire. Uh, and so what eventually will happen is we'll see another major ruler that comes to power here. Charles the Hammer Martel is his name. And he takes over eventually and uh, kind of helps to re reunify the Frankish people here. Um, in the year 732, he, uh, he ends up defeating with his cavalry, defeats the Moors. The Moors were a group of Muslims who had lived in Spain for uh, about 700 years. We talked about the Muslims kind of coming across Northern Africa, and these are the ones that came and settled in uh, Southern uh, Spain. And so uh, they tried to work their way into the Frankish territory, but, uh, but Charles the Hammer, that's where he gets the term, Martel, hammered them back down into Spain uh, and halted the, uh, the Muslim advance into Western Europe. Because of that, he becomes uh, kind of gains the favor of the uh, of the Catholic Church, and the the Catholic Church looks at uh, the Franks as kind of defenders of their faith, um, and he ends up uh, becoming kind of a, a great king at this time with the support of the the Catholic Church as well. Now, he ends up dying in the year 741, and his son Pepin takes over, and he gets the nickname Pepin the Short for obvious reasons. Um, and eventually we're going to see that Pepin the third or Pepin the short, um, he will also lead the Frankish military. And, uh, and when he does so, he, he becomes a pretty decent ruler as well. He ends up taking the military into, if you look in the bottom corner there, you can see into Italy. And while he's into uh, the Italian peninsula there, he starts to grab territory and he ends up uh, giving that territory that he wins in that area to the Catholic Church. They call it the Dominion of Pepin. Um, this strengthens the bond between the Franks and the Catholic Catholic Church so that they really are supporting one another at this point. And the Pope supports Pepin's rule 100%. And because of that, and because of Pepin um, kind of gaining the favor of, of his people, the Franks, and the, the Catholic Church, we see a brand new line of ruling uh, rulers take over here. The Carolinians take over at that point. All right. 
eventually one of these uh, rulers is going to come to power and really gain control of most of Europe at this point. And that man's name is Charlemagne. All right. Charlemagne's rise to power um, has kind of three steps. The first step was he converted all other German groups and German people to Christianity, or at least attempted to convert them to Christianity. Uh, step two was he started to prevent the uh, Muslims from expanding further into Europe once again, just like Charles Martel had done um, by, by hammering them back into Spain. Uh, the, the Muslims tried to uh, gain more territory in the southern Frankish region again, and uh, Charlemagne, the new Frankish king, pushes them back into Spain once again. And then step three is he brutally puts down a Saxon rebellion. The Saxons were another uh, barbarian group, as we've called them, another group of uh, people or a different culture in kind of the north. Um, and so uh, he ends up putting down a rebellion of the Saxons, he, and he tries to convert them again to Christianity. They were very reluctant to convert to Christianity, and he continued to, uh, to try to do that. And so what ended up happening um, on Christmas Day in the year 800 CE, is Charlemagne was attending church at St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. And the, the Pope at the time, Pope Leo III, walked up and crowned him Emperor of the Romans. And so basically meaning that he is kind of the new Roman emperor, even though there is no Roman Empire. Uh, but the idea is here that he is kind of the Christian ruler of Europe at this point. And so it really became more of a symbolic gesture. Uh, but that he, he was there to kind of unite Western Europe. Um, but Charlemagne didn't look at it as, as symbolic. All right. Now he was admired for being a really good warrior and a very devout Christian. And it kind of earned him the nickname of the Holy Barbarian, which is kind of an oxymoron, right? Someone who is uh, this holy Christian, a uh, saintly person, but also this massive barbaric warrior, right? The two don't really go together all that well. But in his eyes, he was trying to do this to help Christianity. So there he is, the emperor of the Romans. Now, because of him being crowned by the Pope, uh, he actually believed that it wasn't just the Pope crowning him, but in his eyes, it was actually because the Pope is kind of the extension of God on earth, that really God chose him to be the emperor of the Romans. All right. So that's uh, the justification that he had to try to extend Christianity throughout the rest of Europe as well. So when we look at Charlemagne, Charlemagne actually became a really good governor when it came to governing the territory. And you can see just how much land and area he controlled. He controls all the Frankish kingdom on that map. Um, the area um, in, in Italy there, northern Italy, all the way down to Rome is, is being controlled basically by the papal states for the most part. And so that's really a, an ally of his. He controls the area of Saxony uh, or the Saxons territory. That's the area that he brutally put down the uh, the Saxon rebellion. And you can see he had kind of that territory um, between present day France and Spain uh, that is um, kind of a buffer zone between the, uh, the Moors, the Muslim Moors of Spain at that point. And so when we look at him, he creates this large self-sufficient empire here, this large kingdom. And the reason was self-sufficient is you have all these small kind of cities that were self-sufficient, these little manors. They, they worked as if they were like little farm, uh, farm places that kind of uh, worked together to uh, make sure they governed themselves. And they all then had to answer to Charlemagne, the king. Inside each of these little self-sufficient manors, he had counts that were in that area to kind of keep control of that territory. And again, all those counts had to answer to him. They're kind of like small governors. And uh, he also had the Misi Dominici, which were the Lord's messengers. And they were actually kind of the people that policed all the counts and everything that was going on throughout the empire. And they answered back to uh, and kind of informed Charlemagne of what was going on so that he could keep control over everything as well. Finally, he ended up uh, moving the capital to what you can see there, Aachen, north of uh, northeast of, of Paris. The city of Aachen became kind of the center of learning. Charlemagne was never formally educated, but he believed education was extremely port important at this time. And so because of uh, him being so, in, believing that education was so important, um, he placed a great value on educating specifically um, the, the youth, basically, and, and looking at kind of the, the nobles or the, the wealthy youth, uh, trying to educate them because one day they may become leaders or uh, military uh, leaders as well. And so wanted to make sure they were educated. He also ordered bishops throughout his kingdom to create libraries so that people could get information and learn. Finally, he ended up bringing together a lot of scholars to help produce a more readable Bible. This was an issue at the time. Most people 
did not speak Latin. And so that became an issue, especially in the, the written version of the Bible. And Catholicism believed that the Bible should only be written in Latin. And so he was trying to bring scholars together to produce a Bible that people, everyday people, could actually read as well. Eventually, just like all good kings, uh, Charlemagne ends up passing away. And when Charlemagne dies, just was like was customary, like we talked about earlier, Charlemagne's kingdom is divided up and given uh, to his son. And actually, uh, he just had the, the one son that was legitimate. And so Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, becomes king. But he ended up being kind of a poor leader. And uh, he, he is not king for very long. And eventually, then the kingdom is divided up again or at this point now divided up and given to Charlemagne's grandsons who take over. And uh, King Louis the Pious, uh, his sons, Charles, Lothar, and Louis end up taking over. And that's where we see a split in the, um, the Frankish Empire, and, and it really never recovers. So they have uh, the empire divided. There's the Treaty of Verdun. There's all kinds of issues where some of the, one of the brothers dies, and maybe it's uh, suspicious um, that one of the other brothers killed him. And so this, this empire, this kingdom really never regains its power that it once had. All right. While it was under Charlemagne, it was known as the Holy Roman Empire, uh, but it really does not uh, continue on after his death. And so with the fall of this Frankish or Holy Roman Empire here, um, division starts to weaken the empire and more barbarians. So like we talked about with the uh, fall of the Western Roman Empire, barbarians come from the, uh, the east and start to invade some of that territory. And we see the loss of the Frankish Empire. We see the loss of this Holy Roman Empire. And so the unification of most of Europe after the fall of Rome with Charlemagne comes to an end. One of those groups that is going to cause some of this uh, this chaos and eventually um, basically reap the benefits of the death of Charlemagne are the Vikings. All right, and the Vikings are going to come in from the north and they are going to uh, definitely take advantage of no major protector and no major unification of Europe at this time. And so who were the Vikings? When we look at the Vikings... Um, they weren't like uh, the, the pictures depict. We don't see any horns on their helmets um, and these you know, battle axes. They did use battle axes, but you can see they didn't quite look like what you might uh, might see in movies. But if we take a closer look, uh, the Vikings were basically sailors. They, they lived a life that was based at sea. Um, very, very good sailors. Essentially, they were pirates. All right? They went from place to place uh, pillaging and, and stealing from different uh, different civilizations here. The English called them the Danes. They were one of the major uh, enemies of the English at this time. That was, uh, England was one of their favorite targets because it was so easy to get to for them. Again, they're coming from Scandinavia. They also were arranged in, when they look at their governments, tribal governments. And the governments were actually fairly democratic. They, they elected rulers or, or leaders at this time, and, and they worked as kind of a, a voting system to some extent. We also see that uh, they valued warfare. And blood feuds were pretty pretty common amongst uh, different Vikings. All right, so they were definitely a warrior culture, uh, and and again based at sea here. So traders and pirates as well. Finally, education was not important at all for the Vikings. They didn't believe in uh, having to have educated people. It was more important to ha to have good warriors, basically. And then lastly, we know a little bit about their religion. They were polytheistic. Uh, and their religion has become a bit of pop culture in the last uh, few years. Uh, we know uh, of, of Odin as their kind of main, main god, and we know of uh, Odin's sons, Loki and Thor, and all of those uh, Norse mythology um, gods and goddesses. So when we look at where they raided and why, and we get into the idea of, of them kind of take coming in and, and taking Europe by storm. And so you can see they tended to live more in the north, uh, but they did raid all throughout really kind of the northern portion of Europe and in other parts of Europe here as well, as you can see from the maps. But they tended to uh, to hit European coastal villages. They would want to get in, hit it, take, steal what they could, take whatever they could and get out as fast as possible. So plundering, killing, burning, taking prisoners was pretty common amongst the, the Vikings and their, and their different groups, the different tribal groups they had. They knew that Europe was extremely weak after Charlemagne. Charlemagne had kind of been the protectorate and the unifier of Europe. And while he was in charge in Europe, they kind of stayed away. Um, they were still uh, there. They still traded, but uh, they weren't doing as much of the uh, plundering and killing and burning uh, as they were after Charlemagne's death. We know that they, uh, they used long ships. 
and some of the the weapon we which actually we saw some of the, the or we saw a picture of the long ship at the very beginning of this uh, these slides here about the Vikings. Uh, we also know that the weaponry they used they used a lot of uh, swords and axes um, and and spears as well. So pretty common to this era. We also know they're extremely experienced sailors. They traded all throughout uh, Europe. You can see uh, some of their early expeditions and trade routes took them into uh, the Mediterranean, took them uh, the Black Sea, Caspian Sea, right into uh, parts of uh, Russia and eventually uh, into obviously uh, North America as well. As you can see, they, they came through Iceland and Greenland and up through uh, parts of present day Canada as well. So overall, what was the impact of the, the Vikings on Europe? And their impact was pretty big. Uh, basically, because of them, Europe was in a state of terror. The people were constantly afraid that uh, at any moment the Vikings could show up and, and kill everyone and take all their possessions. Um, and so the people of Europe looked to the lords that owned the land. Most people in Europe were poor, and they were living on land that wealthy, rich people owned. And they looked to those lords in order to in order to protect them. And so because of the Vikings, we see the beginning of what they call the feudal system in Europe. And so we'll get more into the feudal system in the next uh, day or so here. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. So I hope you enjoyed Charlemagne and the Vikings. We'll uh, hear from you again soon.